a good Friday. Thank you for tuning in to the Gardener's Corner program. My name is Rob Hall. The Gardener's Corner program is a Friday feature here on WKRX 96.7 FM and also on Channel 10 located on Charter Communications Channel 191. Glad to have you along with us today. We're brought to you by T.G. Brooks Company located in Timberlake. 501 Flea Market, located right over here on Durham Road. Sandling Golf Cars, 613 Lewis Street in Oxford. And the Ninth Annual Harvest Show, presented by the Lloyd Granville Agricultural Heritage Association. That's coming up in Butner, Friday, October 2nd, Saturday, October 3rd, and Sunday, October 4th. we give you more about that, information about that show coming up. And, uh... You certainly want to make your way to that show if you're one that enjoys antique tractors and engines and things kind of yesteryear. Without further ado, my friends, just to my right, just to y'all's left, patiently waiting for me to give him the formal <laughs> introduction that he looks forward to each and every week. Although I did throw him a curveball a few weeks ago on his formal in introduction. Yes, he did. But without further ado, please make welcome all the way from the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service, a man who wakes up in the morning and is smiling and ready to go out and do his job. It depends. And his job is to help <laughs> the people of Person in Granville County should they have any problems in their garden in their landscape. And when I say help with their problems, he doesn't come out with any yard tools or anything to actually do work for you. He has knowledge, and he does not mind sharing his knowledge with any and everyone. So if you would, please give him a big round of applause. <laughs> a drum roll, please. <laughs> Mr. Call the Johnny Apple seed of asparagus, <laughs> the big kahuna himself, Mr. Cantaloupe. Oh, <laughs> and a good morning, sir. I'm looking around. Do you have any hip boots? <laughs> we need some, don't we? Getting pretty deep. <laughs> yeah. Getting pretty deep. <laughs> oh, boy. I don't know. I don't think you can top that one. So how you doing, my friend? All right. Good, good, good. Thanks. Anyway, we are live in the studio today, and uh, if you have a question for Carl, uh, feel free to give us a call, 336-599-0266. And um, here it is, just we'll say, the middle of September. That's right. We're actually a little bit past the middle of September. Mm-hmm. But, you know, the weather has been nice. Uh, a little humid today as it was yesterday, but a few days ago it was kind of on the cool side. I think uh, a few mornings ago we was in the high 40s for the low. Okay, yeah. And uh, then in the 80s, so it's been some pretty nice weather this welcome, week. Welcome change to the to the heat. Absolutely. I think we've right. got a caller. Good morning. Thank you for calling the Gardener's Corner program. Yes, sir. I got a question. Okay. Uh, when is a good time to trim your azalea bushes back? I cut mine back last year and they didn't have bloom this spring. Yeah, you need to do it right after they finish blooming. Well, I might well wait then, huh? Yeah, I mean, you can do it now, but then you won't have any flowers next year. That's what time last year. <laughs> yeah, yeah, uh, and a lot of people think that, you know, this time of the year, especially when uh, the leaves start to fall, to uh, fall, that that's the time to get out the pruning shears. And and with most plants, no, it is it is not, so. I cut them back last year, but, but I think, but the fall of the year, but this time, and this spring, they didn't have bloom. Yeah, that's right. So you can yeah. take it you can take them back heavy right after they finish blooming next year okay I appreciate it hey okay. thanks for your call thank you good question there yeah all right we've got another caller good morning thank you for calling the gardener's corner program yes good morning I have a natural area in my front yard that I have been um, 
working with for several years now. Well, in the past year, I've had two mimosa trees trying to grow up in, into it. We keep cutting them down, but they keep coming back and coming back. Mm -hmm. And it's really, you know, I really don't want them in there. And I'm afraid to put any kind of killer on them or to even try to pull them up. I have a beautiful Japanese maple right next to it, and I'm just afraid that, you know, I could damage it. Is there something that I can do to um, to get those out of there? Yeah. When you when they start to come up again, just take uh, some un just just make a fresh cut on on the shoots that come up, uh, and then uh, take some undiluted Roundup and just paint them on the cut cut surfaces. Okay, just paint them on the cut surfaces on the top. Yeah, mm -hmm, after you make the cut. Yep. All right. Thank you so much for your help. All right. Okay. Thanks. Good, for good luck on that. Uh -huh. You know, uh, the mimosa tree is, is one that it it kind of doesn't really spread like wildfire, but if you if you've got one, you know it's not long before you've got several if you don't keep it cut back. Right, and they're not very long lived either. Uh, maybe 10, 15 years tops. They get uh, uh, they get uh, canker diseases, and that usually takes them out. So they're they're not a long lived tree. Now, Carl, just to reiterate the way you answered that question. Just take, uh, when you see the little small shoots coming up, take some uh, clippers or pruning mm -hmm. shears and clip them off. And you say, use undiluted uh, Roundup, Roundup. Which, which, is for, which is the 41% concentration and of just, glyphosate. And just paint it right on the cut surface. That's right. Uh, or, I mean, you know, depending on um, how, how big it is, you know, you, you, know, you can use a... Uh, a paintbrush or something, but for smaller woody plants that are coming up in your flower beds, uh, ones that you don't want, uh, and this is this also works good for climbing um, uh, plants like uh, honeysuckle uh, or, or or other vining plants that get into your shrubs. You certainly can't spray Roundup on them and not kill your your shrubs. So just take your your hand shears and dip the hand shears uh, in uh, undiluted Roundup and then just make the cut and there's enough uh roundup uh, you know on the clippers that it's it's going to you know remain on the on the small um, sh um shoot that you cut off and that'll effectively eliminate a lot of uh unwanted vegetation too so pretty much uh that is what you call selective weed control mm -hmm. in, in, in a sense I guess. yeah and uh what's the guy the uh, weed control Specialist from uh, NC State, he calls that the dip and clip method. The dip and clip. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you know, uh, a, a lot of times uh, I have sprayed some things with um, Roundup, you know, trying to kill them. And um, if it's around a plant or something, it's really hard not to get it on the surrounding plants. And, That's right. And I would have been better off to, to use that idea that, that, that you have just passed along. Yeah, in other words, you don't want to spray and pray. <laughs> <laughs> so dip and clip, and that way you don't have to worry about spraying and praying. That's Although right. it's good to pray, we're not <laughs> yeah. saying that. But but what he means by that, a lot of times if you spray, uh, spray mm -hmm. something, you uh, may need to add in a prayer, hoping that you don't feel more than you intended to. Yeah, that goes that goes back a long way, you know, with people applying uh, you know, a chemical that's not labeled, and you know, well, you know, if, after he sprayed, well, you can guess, just have to resort to spray and pray. Then, you know. There you go. <laughs> well, Carl, before we get into some topic at hands, how's things going with your master garden classes? Uh, very well, very well. Uh, we've got about 21 in, in uh, Person County, 27 in uh, Granville County, and uh, they, they come with a lot of questions, which is good. And, uh, and, and it challenges me, which is good, and it makes me think of other things that I normally wouldn't think of. And, and one thing I'm, I'm guilty of is I start talking about, you know, certain terms, uh, like, uh, well, for example, phytotoxicity. And I know what phytotoxicity is, so I, so I think that, well, everybody else here knows what, what that means, too. But that's not the case uh, many times. So, you know, I have to um, step back and I explain. Phytotoxicity is just a, a fancy word for um, something that's going, going to kill a plant. 
So if something is phytotoxic to the plant, that means it's, it's going to kill it. Yeah. So I, I have to uh, realize that at, at times and then, you know, just uh, uh, sim simplify, simplify a lot of things. Well, you know, uh, Carl, uh, a lot of the terms that you're used to using, you know, a lot of us are folks that have not had. Yeah, you've never any never heard education. them before. That's sure, right. that's right. Well, and so, so it works out well when you all uh, kind of break it down to where oh, yeah. any anybody mm -hmm. can understand it. Sure does. Right. Well, um, Carl, now as far as the the masters gardeners, uh -huh. uh, you know, classes go. Uh, this is something that you started a few years back, is that yeah, correct? Yeah, this is the third year now. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the logic behind the master's, master gardener's classes is it's no charge to take them. Just uh, the only thing that you're kind of asked to do is to kind of give back, you know, some of the knowledge that you have learned. That's right. Uh, let's get a word on for one of our fine supporting sponsors. Been with us here on the Gardener's Corner program a great number of our shows and hope they will continue to be with us. Out of Timberlake, North Carolina, they've been in business since 1936. And um, we're going to take a trip down to T.G. Brooks Company. They have always got something for you, no matter what the season of the year may be. So let's take a trip to T.G. Brooks Company. Hey, little by little, fall is starting to creep in, and it's time now to get your pansies at T.G. Brooks Company. Also, your collards, cauliflower, cabbage, broccoli, and other fall vegetables. They've got them. This is the best time of the year right now to get your yard off to the best start. The best time. Remember to kill those weeds in the lawn and get ready for fall seeding. T.G. Brooks Company has the lawn chemicals to do the job. This is the best time of the year to enrich and repair your lawn. T.G. Brooks Company has the new top choice turf grass seed for greener and plusher lawns. Also available are rental lawn aerators and pull and walk behind pluggers and spreaders. Bag and bulk mulches and bulk planting soil available too. They have your fertilizers and lime. They still have plenty of lawn sprinklers, water hose, and water hose fittings if you need hose repair. If you need yard tools, why, they are in abundance, plus wheelbarrows. Pick up a couple of those nice rakes while you're there. Fresh pine needles are available, and if you are the homeowner or you are the professional landscaper, both get the same kind of service, and they're set up to handle commercial accounts. No matter what part of Person or Durham County, it is worth the drive to come to the one source to handle your fall needs for your lawn and your flower garden. Also, for your Taylor water stoves, they have the parts that you need. They're available. They're, they're, get them serviced now. Get them set up for wintertime. Parts available at T.G. Brooks on Taylor Water Systems. And they have dog kennels, too. Your family will love you when you finish up the day with a delicious hand-cut ribeye steak that you bought while you're there shopping. And a bowl of homemade ice cream from one of their ice cream freezers will still taste good on these September days. They've been around since 1936. People have trusted T.G. Brooks Company for sound advice when it comes to lawn, garden, and home. They take pride in serving the homeowner, the farmer, and all those in construction. They're at 411 Helena Mariah Road next door to Community Pharmacy in Timberlake. Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program. Glad to have you folks tuned in. And um, anyway, the Gardener's Corner program today brought to you by T.G. Brooks Company. We just heard a word from them. In just a few minutes, we'll get a word on for Sandling Golf Cars, and then we'll head on over to 501 Flea Market, and then we'll tell you all about the Lloyd Granville Agricultural Heritage Association. But our resident expert... It's Mr. Carl Cantalupi of the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. Found a topic that uh, that that is uh, that is current. We can talk about and uh, let's see. I wonder. If I don't think that's for us. Okay. Yet, so. um, people were asking uh, about this. Um, uh, actually, the other day I got a call and someone was describing to me uh, symptoms on on their roses, and was wondering what was what was going wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a a. a a virus uh, disease called rose rosette and it's transmitted by small mites 
and uh, this is what it looks like uh, on your um, on your plant you you notice that the new growth remains a red color and it also forms what we call a witch's broom uh, pattern or a deformed pattern and um, in other words, uh, witch's broom is kind of like a, uh, a, a new growth that is kind of uh, s like a, a, a spike, kind of like a, a witch's broom. It's kind of, uh, kind of uh, spindly. So you get this spindly growth with the new growth remaining uh, pink, uh, never gets out of what we call the juvenile stage. So, uh, as you see here, this is the retention of uh, the juvenile state of the plant, uh, the red shoot color. Then, if you look at the new growth, you you have extreme thorniness, and the new growth is very pliable and flexible, and you have a huge amount of thorns produced on these uh, on the new growth of the rose. Okay, so if you have something that looks like this, uh, the the red color, and uh, you have uh, you know like kind of twisted growth. Uh, this is the uh, rose rosette virus. So the next thing to, that people ask, what can I do about it? Well, because it's a virus, the virus, the insect introduces it into the plant, and then it, it moves throughout the plant and eventually kills the entire plant. So unfortunately, you have to dig up the whole plant and get rid of it. Uh, the, the safe thing to do is um, after you... Uh, uh, you d dig it up, make the uh, make uh, cuts with the shovel, um, put the p uh, cover the plant with a bag, a plastic bag, S and then so that when you take it out of the area, any mites that might still be on the plant stay on the plant, and they don't spread to other roses if you have other roses that aren't affected. So it, by by putting the bag over it, it kind of keeps everything yeah. together, mm -hmm. and um, you can discard it whether uh, you want to send it to the landfill or if yeah. you want to burn it you know but uh just you know as carl said by putting the bag on it uh hopefully everything will be contained yeah so uh that's one that uh, was just uh, identified two years ago uh this rose rosette virus and it's uh it it, it can be severe they're looking at uh, breeding roses that are resistant to it and hopefully hopefully they can yeah. well Carl um, last week we talked some about the emerald ash borer mm -hmm. and we had talked about it some last year yep uh, I was talking with the gentleman that lives down um, close by pretty much on Mayo Lake mm -hmm. and um, he was saying that he had a ash tree die in his yard and he was telling me that he had heard us talking about the emerald ash borer. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to ask, okay. um, if you would explain how the emerald ash borer affects the ash tree and what I mean by that, uh, how can you tell if you do have a, a, a dying ash tree? Uh, can you all, uh, mm -hmm. you know, pretty much go through that? Sure. Okay. Well, uh, here we have some slides that shows that show that to you. First of all, what is it? The uh, the emerald ash borer is a non-native wood boring beetle in the common group of beetles known as the buprestids. The adult the adult beetle is shiny metallic green, and the larvae are white, and their bell shaped seg segments are distinctive. Uh, and here you see a picture, uh, and uh, what does it do? Well, it feeds in the gal they, it feeds just underneath the bark in the cambium layer. That's the area of the tree where it's, where it's, uh, where it's putting down new cells and it's actively dividing. So they feed in the, um, in the cambium region and they cut, cut off the, the xylem and the, f the phloem vessels in the tree or the water and, and the food conducting uh, vessels of the tree. And when, when a lot of these v uh, vessels are cut off, the tree can't take up water and nutrients anymore, so the, so the trees die. And uh, this slide shows the, the life cycle of the beetle. Uh, the adults emerge from between May through July. Then we have the larvae come. Uh, uh, I mean, the eggs eggs are laid on uh, on the the uh, the tree. The larvae come out and they start boring in, into the into the tree. 
and uh, here you see a picture of uh, the, larv the larvae on the left and if you look real close you can see the segments are bell shaped so that's a key identification uh, key uh, to identifying this insect and the, then the picture on the right shows the extensive galleries that they make which girdle the tree and so it can't uh, uptake water and nutrients anymore. So more or less when one dies, uh, probably the first effect you would see is the leaves turning brown and then maybe leaves start to fall. That's right, that's right. Mm -hmm. Now the, the emerald ash borer larvae usually attack by the hundreds or thousands, wow. causing the tree to lose virtually all of its vascular tissue in a short period of time. Uh, the bark was removed from this dead ash tree to reveal the extensive damage caused by heavy larval feeding. And uh, what, what ash trees are affected? All, affected all trees in the Fraxinus genus. Most common in North Carolina include the white, green, pumpkin, and Carolina ash. Other species may have been planted including uh, blue and black um, ash. It doesn't matter if the trees are young, old, healthy, or weak emerald ash borer will attack them all. Uh, the mountain ash and wafer ash, even though they have ash in the common name, are not in the Fraxinus genus, and so they're not affected. Uh, neither are any other genus or species. So it's, so it's just the, um, uh, the uh, white, green, pumpkin, and Carolina ash, and you can see uh, the differences between them in the picture there. Well, Carl, while you were talking about uh, the how the emerald ash borer affects ash trees. Mm -hmm. um, I had a thought about the peach tree borer okay. that you have said affects any kind of stone fruit mm -hmm. family tree. Um, and just and this go sound crazy. Wonder how it would be if you did have ash trees in. in, in in your landscape or around your house. Mm -hmm. Wonder how it would be if you kind of um, doused the trunk of the tree with the same chemical that you would peach trees to take care of the um, the the peach tree bore. Wonder would that have any effect on it? Uh, well, and probably not now because the. Uh, the uh, the eggs have been laid. The larvae are there now, so there uh, the adults only lay eggs from May through July. So so a preventive treatment now wouldn't do any good. Uh, right. Yeah. So that's that's the main difference there. And um, uh, with peach tree borer, of course, now is the time to treat for those. We're getting kind of uh, on the tail end of that. The the main uh, time to treat for the peach tree borer would include from. Uh, uh, mid-August through mid-September. So if you haven't got, gotten a treatment uh, to control peach tree borer, now is the time to do it. And then um, the, uh, the material to use is, um, there's several homeowner products. I know Bonide makes one called the borer and, and miner spray, M-I-N-E-R. And um, that, uh, I, can, I don't know why I can never get these straight. I think, uh, it has permethrin. That's the active ingredient, and um, uh, just mix it up in a in a watering can, according to label directions, and then just uh, drench the upper three feet of the trunk. I'm not upper, lower three feet. In other words, the distance between the ground and three feet up on the on the trunk. Just water it in with the uh, solution, and be sure that you saturate the soil around the tree as well, because the the peach tree borer likes to lay eggs just uh, close to the soil line and right up against the trunk. Right. So, when that call, uh, w w w with that being said, uh, typically it's best to do several treatments throughout you know that time that that you said it starts with. yeah you can uh, you can make one on uh, August the 15th uh, and you know, I'm trying to think what I did I think I made one in, in mid-august late August 
and I just finished making another one um, last weekend. So pr probably two treatments is, is, is all that you really need. Uh, August 15th, uh, you can make one, and then, uh, you know, between uh, September 1st and, and 15th, or, or if you haven't made any, now is definitely a, a time to, uh, to make a treatment. And you might want to scratch around uh, the, uh, the base of the tree and, and see if you can see any, uh, any eggs or larvae. And if they are, you know, the, the, uh, the insecticide will be there to kill them. If you see any uh, sawdust or not sawdust in the, in the case of peach tree borer, if you see any gummy sap coming out of the tree, that's a dead giveaway. And see if you can, uh, you know, take your finger and uh, try to remove the borer or just take a... Um, uh, a stiff wire and put in there and see if it, you know a lot of times you can pierce the bore inside the uh, inside the tree well Carl uh, with, with 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 the peach tree bore it seems to me that you had said in the past that most of the time the peach tree bore mm -hmm. likes to affect younger trees five mm -hmm. years and under is that correct that's that's correct and this can be not only the fruiting uh, members of the the genus Prunus uh, but the ornamentals as well, ornamental plum, ornamental cherry, um, or, uh, plum cherry, uh, flowering peach, uh, they, they don't discriminate. They'll, as long as they're, they're young trees, those are the ones that they, they like to affect. Okay. Um, well, look, uh, let's talk just to briefly about, you know, here in Roxburgh and Person County, mm -hmm. we're fortunate we have two farmer's markets. Right. Uh, we have one down on Depot Street, which is Roxburgh Farmer's Market. They're usually there weekdays and Saturdays uh, from about 7 a.m. until lunchtime. Uh, head on by and see them for all kind of fresh vegetables and tasty treats. And then we also have the Person County Farmer's Market that is open Saturday mornings 8 a.m. until 12 noon and Wednesday afternoons 3 until 6. And it's located on Madison Boulevard, right across from Cookout Restaurant. So it's two locations here in Roxburgh and Person County to where you can more or less shop local and get items that are raised right here in Person and surrounding yeah. counties. I generally have some a list of what's available, but I don't have one this morning. So, um, But it's always good. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again... The Person County Farmer's Market will be open tomorrow, Saturday, 8 a.m. until 12 noon. Mm -hmm. Let's take a trip down to Oxford, and we'll stop in and see the friendly folks at Sandling Golf Cars. They've got a huge selection of golf cars, utility trailers, also stock trailers, dump trailers. The list goes on. Also, Wilmington Grills available at Sandling Golf Cars. You would certainly enjoy grilling out on a Wilmington Grill from Sandline Golf Cars. Are you in need of a trailer? Sandline Golf Cars has master tow utility trailers and tow dollies. Dump trailers and equipment trailers up to 32 foot that can handle 20,000 pounds by load trail. You can also get Calico stock trailers and Pace enclosed trailers up to 24 foot at Sandline Golf Cars. So if you have something to haul, most likely you can find the trailer you need at Sandline Golf Cars. Some trailer payments start as low as $100 per month. See Al Hillary O'Wheel for all of your trailer needs. Call Sandling Golf Cars at 919-693-4626 or toll free 1-800-221-9267 or log on to sandlinggolfcars.com. Or better yet, stop in and see the friendly folks in Oxford just off the bypass at Sandling Golf Cars. Open weekdays 8 a.m. until 5.30 p.m. and Saturdays 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. Call 919-693-4626 or toll free 1-800-221-9267. Sandling Golf Cars is a Trojan battery dealer and they also have a full line of club car and easy go golf cars, parts, and they also offer repair service on just about any brand of golf car. 
It's grilling season, and you would enjoy grilling out on a Wilmington Grill from Sandling Golf Cars, 613 Lewis Street in Oxford. Here we are back on the Gardens Corner program. I want to say a special thank you to Phil the Peel Fix-It Man. <laughs> uh, he actually came out just a few minutes ago and uh, brought along a couple of the Old Farmer's Almanacs, uh, the 2016 edition. Uh, he brought one for myself and one for Mr. Cantaloupe. And he has been bringing us these Old Farmer's Almanacs for the last few years, and we really appreciate it. And want to let you know to check out your local place in your area for the 2016 Old Farmer's Almanac. And uh, it's kind of neat to just kind of read through and, and see some of the things. And, uh, you know, weekday mornings here on WKRX at 615, we have a program that we carry, and it's called the Old Farmer's Almanac Radio Report. And it's a pretty neat little program. They talk about everything from, you know, the moon to old folklore. And one day this past week, they was talking about signs of winter. And they were saying that some of the telltale signs to uh, a, a cold winter or a hard winter is if it's a large amount of acorns, also... They were telling how you could take a persimmon and look at the seed, and if it looks like a spoon, I think that means it's going to be a snowy winter, or if it looks like a fork, that means something else, or if it looks like a knife, that has other meanings. But one other thing that they made mention of was um, was a hornet nest, and, and they were saying that a lot of times that when you see a hornet nest way up behind the trees, that that is kind of a sign of a hard, cold winter. Well, that gets me to wonder, what does it mean if you see a hornet's nest uh, inside uh, your uh, an outdoor electric outlet? <laughs> I, I, I don't know what it means, but i tell you what I would do. I would beware. Yeah. It's give you a jolting experience. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Which well, I found one outside uh, the other day at my house. The, uh, the electric outlet outside has a cover over, over the outlet. And I saw these things flying inside that thing. And what, just hornets actually built a nest because there's, there's just a little opening underneath the cover that you, you know, put your finger up in to... Uh, to press it so that the it will open up. Open up. Yeah. So I got out the old hornet and wasp killer and, <laughs> and did a number yeah. on them. And you messed up their house party. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Never well, never seen any in there, but wow. It's amazing where the, where the wasp and yellow jackets can build nests. Mm -hmm. But uh, on our farm, we have, I know, two black hornet nests. Oh, boy. And these are the, the ones called that, what they're made out of, I don't know, but the or, kind of the gray looking. Yeah, that might be the, the paper wasps, yeah. Mm -hmm. And anyway, we, we've got one that's right on the side of a building. Mm -hmm. And then we noticed one the other day that was pretty high up in the tree. And when I say pretty high up, I'm going to say probably 25 or so feet up mm -hmm. in, in the tree. And mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that kind of got me to thinking, wondering, you know, we're going to have a, have a whole car cold winter this week this year you know mm -hmm. uh, just I, I just don't know but it's interesting you know about some of the the signs and you know a lot of people that have arthritis when they're you know the knees and elbows and things start to ache they say it's a chance of rain you know and stuff like that and I hadn't got quite that good about predicting weather and things if i walk out outside and it's raining i know it's raining <laughs> there's know, and that's that's about it with me <laughs> <laughs> well i don't know if this is true or not but this is something that our uh, entomology professor told us once in college he knew of a woman that was uh, severely stricken with arthritis so so she was outside walking one day and she fell into a nest of of yellow jackets and they they stung her unmercifully all over and he said it cured her of her arthritis wow well 
Uh, I guess anything is anything is possible. Yeah. Well, you know, um, I, I will say this: if you do have arthritis and you get in a yellow jacket nest, it will make you forget about the arthritis for a while. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> But anyway, we are live in the studio today, and I uh, would be glad to hear from you, 336-599-0266. And um, I think you have a photograph mm -hmm. on the TV screen, and for those of you that are listening on the radio, at your convenience, sometimes log on to RadioRoxburgh.com, and you can watch past editions of the Gardener's Corner program. And Carl has no telling how many different pictures of slides that he can put on the TV screen. And we know you can't see them if you're listening to us on the radio. But if you log on to RadioRoxburgh.com and watch past editions of the Gardener's Corner program, you can see these visual aids and I kind of set forth the point a little bit more. And, Carl, I, I can't see the picture very well that you have. Mm -hmm. uh, for some reason, the picture size on your laptop today is extremely small. Yeah. But is that a, a spot of the brown patch fungus? Yes, it is. Absolutely. Very very good, Rob. Uh, that is brown patch. And the reason why I put it up there is, uh, first of all, the slide is, is credited to Lane Treadway. He's uh, uh, extension. Mr. Mrs. Treadway's son. What? <laughs> Mr. and Mrs. Treadway's son. Well, I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, go ahead. Uh, he's an extension specialist at NC State. Uh, and he, uh, these, these are uh, some of his slides. You see the brown patch fungus moving across the lawn in spots. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> here's one close up. The reason I put these on is... Um, uh, when you're interested in uh, in plant diseases and plant pathology, it, it makes you more aware of what's going on, you know, uh, outside. And uh, I've seen um, around one fast food restaurant here in Roxborough what looks to be brown patch, and I see the same thing. Uh, I saw the same thing the other day in a, another fast food restaurant in uh, in Oxford. So and uh, you know, there's a lot of uh, areas like this that are just dying out. So it, it could be one of two things. I didn't get out and um, and get on my hands and knees and look real close, uh, which uh, our uh, uh, plant, path plant pathology professor in college always used to say, a uh, sign of a good turf grass pathologist is one with his fanny in the air. <laughs> <laughs> So I, I, I didn't get my fanny in the air to go, to go down and look. But it's either one of two things. It's either brown patch fungus or uh, it just could, uh, it could be just uh, over-fertilization and, and fertilizer burn. So it's one of the two, but it is showing up now. Uh, that's why it's important uh, to not be heavy-handed with the fertilizer and definitely do not fertilize cool season grasses in the spring with a lot of nitrogen because this is what happens uh, in the summer and later uh, once, it, uh, once the, the temperatures uh, get hot and, uh, and if it stays dry for a long period. Uh, this is actually what you'll see if you look at... Uh, uh, if you look at it real close, you kind of have a white, uh, the, the uh, uh, plant pathology term is a white mycelium. Mycelium is a, is a white branch, th uh, thread-like uh, uh, fungal structure that you see right at the, li the line of demarcation between healthy uh, grass and dead grass. You, you see this kind of whitish growth. Then if you look real close, you can actually see spores of the, uh, or lesions, uh, spots on the, on the grass plants that uh, indicate the, uh, the brown patch fungus. So, um, and then if you look real close, you can see uh, bleached out areas on the, on the grass stem, uh, which is an, also a sign of, of the brown patch. So, uh, anyway, I thought it was kind of interesting to see, uh, you know, this occurring 
two different areas, you know, around two different uh, fast food uh, locations, and uh, no doubt they have, you know, companies that that Good. fertilize, right. and, and, and you see it's kind of like a patchwork quilt, so, you know, spots, uh, round, square, irregular spots all over the, uh, uh, the grass. Right. So more or less the point Carl is making, if you have cool season grasses in your landscape, now is the time to fertilize. If you have not done soil samples, go ahead and do them. Mm -hmm. uh, it'll take about two weeks to get the results back, but you'll still have time after that to fertilize cool season grasses. Don't wait until spring of the year. Do it now. Right. All right, let's take a trip out to 501 Flea Market. They're open on Saturday and Sundays. And, you know, no matter what the weather is, uh, whether it's uh, hot or rainy, you can go inside the indoor flea market on 501 and be out of the rain, out of the sunshine. They've got a lot of things to offer. Here's more information. If you're looking something to do this weekend, why not make a trip out to 501 Flea Market and shop with the indoor vendors. They've got a huge selection of items indoors at the 501 Flea Market located 2285 Durham Road across from KFC. They're open Saturdays 7 a.m. until 2 p.m. Sundays 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. The indoor vendors at 501 Flea Market has antiques, books, coins, collectibles, clothing items, fresh produce, furniture, Hot Wheels, incense, jewelry, knives, movies, both DVD and VHS. You can also find pottery, office furniture, signs, tools, and good food. Something for all ages can be found indoors at the 501 Flea Market. No matter what the weather may be, you'll find it delightful inside of the 501 Flea Market located 2285 Durham Road across from KFC. Open Saturdays, 7 a.m. until 2 p.m. Sundays, 8 a.m. until 2 p.m. It's a 501 flea market indoors this weekend. All right. Here we are back on the Gardener's Corner program. My name is Rob Hall, Mr. Carl Cantalupi of the North Carolina Cooperative Extension Service. Uh, Carl, here it is, September 18th. Mm-hmm. Is it too late to plant any warm season vegetables? I would say yeah, uh, although I actually made a planting of green beans a couple of years ago around this time, and I was actually picking beans in November. So I, I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not saying if you do that, you can certainly pick green beans in November, but, uh, you know, the, there is a chance if the, if the season remains warm that you could. Now... Uh, typically in October is when we start our chances of frost. October 15th. October 15th. Mm, about, 50, about a 50% chance. So uh, if the season is right, you may have time mm -hmm. to uh, get them planted and, and harvest them. Now, how about cool season vegetables? Cool season vegetables, I mean, you can still... If you can find transplants of cabbage, cauliflower, broccoli, collards, you know, certainly give them a try. Again, if it gets real cold, uh, it's not going to kill the plants because they can take down to 26 degrees with no problem. But the amount of growth that you're going to get out of those plants aren't going to be that great. But, uh, you know, if you have some space in the garden, definitely, uh, you know, try some. Uh, go ahead and um, uh, seed mustard and turnips, you know, uh, if you haven't done so already with those and um, give those a try also in areas of the garden that you don't want to plant any more vegetables now would be a good time to sow cover crops a cover crop is um, is uh, our uh, plants that you uh, start from seed um, wheat uh, or sometimes called winter wheat rye grain um, these are seeded and then uh, the plants form a good uh, deep tap, uh, tap root or fibrous root system that can break up heavy clay soils, provide organic matter, provide better air drainage and, and water uh, infiltration. Uh, and you might want to uh, also try um, uh, winter, um, Austrian winter pea or hairy vetch 
or even clover. Now, these three that I've just mentioned, these are called legumes because it, it, they're in the legume family. Uh, they're in the same family as beans, uh, snap beans, and uh, English peas. Uh, they have the capability of fixing nitrogen from the air. Now, how do they do that? by means of a, a, a type of bacteria called uh, rhizobium bacterium. <laughs> and uh, the rhizobium bacteri bacterium <laughs> colonizes in little white round galls um, or nodules that are on the root system of a plant. So if you, if you dig up a bean plant and look at the roots and you see these uh, kind of whitish looking bumps on the roots, these are the nodules that they're, they're fixing the, they're, they're capable of fixing the nitrogen. And um, <coughs> if you buy seed, if you buy uh, seed from a seed company, um, a lot of times they'll offer, um, along with the seed, uh, uh, packages of an, an inoculant. An inoculant is the rhizobium bacteria, kind of in a black powder. So you, you mix up the seed in this black powder and water, and then this, this powder <coughs> coats the, the outer seed coating of the, of the seed. And then, so what you're doing is you're physically putting that bacteria right into that germinating seed. And then once that's done, um, the, uh, the bacterium can survive in the soil for many, many years, okay. which, is, which is good. So that's kind of one of the marvels of um, Mother Nature, it, it, and that is with uh, plants that are legumes that can fix the nitrogen. So if you use these as a, as a cover crop in the fall, then next spring you till it up, and there you have nitrogen already available to, the, to whatever you want to plant. Okay, some good advice yeah. right there. We, we need to get a word on for the Lord Granville Agricultural Heritage Association, and we'll be back to wrap it up here on the Gardener's Corner program. Are you someone that enjoys antique tractors and equipment? Why don't you make it your plans to be in the town of Butner coming up on Friday, October 2nd through Sunday, October 4th for the 9th Annual Harvest Show sponsored by the Lord Granville Agricultural Heritage Association. Antique tractors and equipment on display, hit and miss engines. They'll have a parade of power. Be sure to check out the farm shop, also Mama's Kitchen, and Old Time Cooking. This year's show will be featuring Corvette trucks and tractors. For more information, log on to the World Wide Web at lgaha.com or call 919-528-1652. The show is taking place in Butner, North Carolina, the corner of 12 NG Streets. It's the ninth annual harvest show sponsored by the Lord Granville Agricultural Heritage Association. $5 daily admission to children 12 and under free. Proceeds will support the scholarship fund. That's Friday, October 2nd, noon until 5. Saturday, October 3rd, 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. And Sunday, October 4th, 11 a.m. until 4 p.m. It's the ninth annual Harvest Show, sponsored by Lord Granville Agricultural Heritage Association. That was close. <laughs> hey, tell you what, we're going to wrap it up on the Gardener's Corner program, but um, tomorrow in Orange County, in Hillsboro, it's going to be bluegrass at Moorfields. Uh, for more information, you can log on to moorfields.org. But uh, they've got five bands. The music will start tomorrow at 1 o'clock, and it runs until 6 o'clock. They'll also have food trucks, beer, and wine. Again, this is at Moorefields in Hillsboro. Again, log on to moorefields.org. They'll have the Piedmont regulators, Tony Williamson and Son, the uh, Kayak Farm Boys, Nixon, Blevins, and Gage, and Donna Hughes. But if you would like a couple of tickets, if you'll be caller number two to 599-0266, right now, you will be the winner of two tickets. But now I must say this is Friday, and we will replay the show tomorrow morning. So if you're watching the Gardener's Corner program and it's Saturday morning, no need to call. We'll be able to give the tickets away. But 
0266. Caller number two gets two tickets to Bluegrass at Moorfields in Hillsboro. Fast thinking, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, without any more delays, I think it's time for you and I to make our way uh, on sign out of off. the building. That's right. Uh, special thanks to Mr. Carl Cantalupe. Thank you, Rob. And appreciate the knowledge that you have. We appreciate mm -hmm. our sponsors. The Lloyd Granville Agricultural Heritage Association, Sandaline Golf Cars, 501 Flea Market, and T.G. Brooks Company. We want to wish you and yours a happy and safe weekend, and we look forward to seeing you next week on another edition of the